All righty, we're going to get started. It is exactly 5 o'clock. So for those of you who are taking the 610 bus, we're done at 6, if I am reminded. Actually, I have a watch, so I'm going to keep track. So we're going to only have an hour today. Twofold, it's a holiday, and uh, I'm going to take the holiday. <laughs> that, and uh, having a little allergy attack today, so I'm not really feeling my best, so... In an effort to make everybody happy, we are going for an hour today. So next week, well, actually, in the last class, I counted five reminders. I'm not quite sure how I'm gonna how many I'm gonna have in here, but about five. Reminder number one is next week we have final exam review. So show up for that class, actually, and you'll hear everything there is to know about the final exam. If you're curious, you weren't here for the other class. We have uh, 25 questions, multiple choice, <clears throat> taken from a pool of about 200 to, well, it's about 200, 150 to 200 questions for this class. So you may end up with a lot of one, very little on another. The question pool varies, will vary per exam. Uh, there'll be like eight different sets of the exam. So long story short, I'll tell you the subject areas to study. And then when you get your exam, don't say, hey, you know, how come this, day, hey, this, this exam was like heavily focused on SQL or, I don't know, on something else. And I don't know anything about that. You know, so maybe, hopefully, you'll be in luck and it'll be focused on something you want. Or it'll be focused, spread out throughout the entire content of the course, hopefully. Because uh, I will manually look at them and see, you know, what kind of questions ended up on each one. Okay, that's, uh, that was announcement number one. So final exam review next week. Announcement number two is after next week, we have no more class. Instead, we have final exams that run for two weeks. If you haven't noticed, there's a final exam schedule out. I went over it last time, told you uh, about the time slots and stuff like that. Um, you only show up during those two weeks for the exam. There's no class. If you don't like your time slot, send me an email message, and I can move you to a time slot that you like. Uh, it doesn't have to be for this particular class. You can be in any one of the time slots. I have a lot of people going and taking all of their exams at the same time. And a lot of people have actually opted to do it on the April 30th, May 1st weekend because it's later. Here's the problem, though. It's going to be hectic. So if you want quiet, peace and quiet, the earlier you take your exams, like if you start in the first week, you'll have peace and quiet and karma, and it'll, it'll actually be nice. If you wait till the very last day, it's going to be a, it's going to be a madhouse. I mean, we're going to have too many people, and it's going to be unorganized. So I, I can just predict it ahead of time. So earlier the better. But some of you uh, might be leaving to go in summer. So if the time schedule in the next two weeks doesn't meet your needs, let me know. We can um, arrange it to have it proctored with one of the TAs. We can do, do all sorts of different things. The only thing that you have to remember is you have to take the final exam in person and it has to be done before the end of the term if you want to grade in the course. If not, you'll get an incomplete grade and you can come back next fall and take the exam to make up the grade. Um, so that was announcement number two. Announcement number three was that ITU cares about Japanese people. And there's a, I don't know, I'm a really bad spokesperson. There's a Japanese fund, a uh, support fund, to help out the people of the recent victims of the recent events that have occurred. If you'd like to contribute, we have a nice fancy Tupperware jar over here for which you can put in your hard-earned dollars to show your support for the Japanese people. 100% of the funds will go towards that. Nothing, nothing gets taken out of that. I hope I'm right. Nothing gets taken out of that for anything else. So all of it will go towards the campaign to, uh, to show that we... Um, like uh, you want to help out, stuff like that. <clears throat> um, so that was that number three. Uh, that was announcement number three. Announcement number four-ish. I don't know how many I have. We have uh, a survey going around um, that evaluates me, I believe. Uh, end of course, end of end of course student survey. Um, I don't. The TAs are managing that. I don't get to see that at all, uh, which means you can say whatever you want. It's confidential, and it doesn't affect your grade. Um, I encourage you to make comments about things that you might want to be uh, seen to be improved in ITU, in the facilities, in the classes, in the offerings, in the instructor, well, uh, particularly me. Um, so anyway, uh, feel free to, you know, present your uh, unbiased, you know, your, your honest feedback. Um, I don't get to see those, so it doesn't really matter, and it doesn't affect your grade, so 
hopefully, uh, you know, you'll get on that list. The other, uh, I'm, I'm missing an announcement. Yes, assignments and projects. Ah, assignments and projects, thank you. See, the TAs do come in handy. <laughs> assignment number five. <clears throat> For this particular course, we have, let me pull it up. I actually made sure I pulled it up here. We have six assignments and four projects. If you haven't been around and you haven't noticed and you haven't heard this yet, you have extra credit opportunities because two of the assignments can be skipped or one of the projects for a total of 10 points. The projects, the four of them are worth 10 points each. The assignments are worth five points each. In fact, for this particular course, a majority of the grading is on the projects and the assignments. I think the final exam is like only like 10% or something. It's really low, actually. So you're going to make up most of your points with the assignments or with the projects. If you do all of them, you'll end up with 10 extra credit points. If you don't want to do all of them, you can skip two of the five points or one of the 10 point. And that combination will give you 10 points. Hopefully that makes sense. If anyone has any questions, you can ask me. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to make a video. I was just reminded. I totally forgot I mentioned it last time. I'll make a video, YouTube video, on uh, ERD diagrams to help you out with some of the assignments. I'm going to try and hopefully do this by the end of the week, see how the week goes. Um, I'm thinking in the next couple of days my allergies should clear up, so I'll be a happier camper, so I'll be more enthusiastic about doing it, so hopefully uh, that will happen. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I'll pick uh, some of the harder ones of the assignments and give away a couple of the answers just to show you examples. Um, at the end of the course, I do have solution sheets actually for every one of them if you want to see the solution. Um, I'm not going to post it on the internet because what will end up happening is it will be all over the place. I'd rather give it out individual by individual after I verify that you've actually completed the assignments and you sign this little agreement that says I'm not going to share this with anybody else. So. <laughs> All right, any questions on the assignments or on the projects or on the final exam? Again, you can switch the date if you don't like the date that was given to you. The final exam schedule is actually at this website, and it is right, nope, it's, it's right at the beginning. It is, no? Main, 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 way back in the beginning of the beginning. It's back in the beginning of the beginning. It's on the main page. Right here, actually. So it's a Word file. You can download it, take a look at it. If you don't like um, this particular class, you can take this particular exam in any of the other class sessions. So you're very, um, very flexible in terms of when you're going to take it. So, but you must take it in person and bring your student ID when you take it because um, you can only take your exam once. So we don't want one person coming in taking it for like five people or something. So, <coughs> any other questions before we get started? That was easy. <coughs> All right, so today I'm actually going to cover uh, storage concepts, and then we're going to get into reporting. We are slowly winding down in terms of the content for this course. I've gone through and I've selectively uh, picked out what I want to cover for the rest of the course. And I'm covering 7B, which is on storage, and I'm going to cover 10A. I may not actually finish both of them today. Um, we're also going to cover Lecture 11. Um, Lecture 11 is on, uh, hold on one second, it should be coming out, um, Advanced Database Application Development. I'm going to cover that next week along with um, the final exam review because it's really kind of a capstone. It really covers a lot of things in terms of applying Oracle with real systems and businesses. Um, these two particular lectures, 7B and uh, 10A, kind of read like a book. So I'm not going to cover them in a lot of detail, but I'm going to highlight a few things um, in terms of uh, you know what it is you probably should pay attention to in terms of content. Uh, but then you know wait till next week to find out exactly what you have to know. I can tell you right now though, that, and you can just make a mental note or jot it down. Lecture eight, nine, and ten B will not be on the final exam. I rarely cover those anyway. It's extra reading if you want. One of them covers uh, Oracle reports. And the other ones cover miscellaneous features. One of them actually is actually a repeat. Uh, the numbering got off, so I don't know how that happened. But uh, I think it's actually number nine. It's a repeat of stuff we've already seen. Uh, but you can just make a mental note. Lecture 8, 9, and 10B, you can skip those completely. Don't even look at them. Um, and I'll, I'll obviously tell you next week what to study for in particular. <coughs> so 7B is 
questions about data storage. And uh, I'm not going to get into the particulars of this because what ended up happening is uh, with more current versions of Oracle, we've got changes. And uh, with the changes, I can't cover all of the different changes. What I want to do is just kind of hit the concept. And the concept of the terms of the differentiation between the logical and the physical structures. In our traditional database environment, the biggest concern that we have is storage, uh, storage space in particular. It's usually confined to physical disks, hard drives, uh, usually on a server, usually in a server environment. Oracle actually works with its own storage concept. It's an abstraction that is created that utilizes the underlying hardware, but it creates a bit a different kind of structure. Because here's what happens. We can't just take an image of a database and span it out over five disks by using regular I.O. that's supported of the operating system. And plus, we, if we rely upon the support of the operating system, we run into limitations, obviously. Um, which is why, actually, Oracle doesn't work too well on Windows. Because there's a limitation how large the drives can be. And in terms of NT, the old days, there was problems in terms of the storage space. So most people would actually opt for a Unix server because you can get a distributed environment which you have multiple systems, multiple space, and you can span out the memory that you're storing all your stuff on on multiple systems uh, and link them all together. And if you do that, then you take advantage of <coughs> huge space allocation um, that you may not necessarily have in a single kind of computer environment. So we'll look at creating uh, many different types of table spaces, configuring, viewing, storage, table spaces, data files, and the use of the undo data to kind of put that, those pieces together in terms of the concept. So in terms of the internal structure, the structure of every table, view, and object that you create is being stored. It's actually being stored the same way we have space that's partitioned out for each one of these objects. We have areas that are segmented and I'll show you the segment structure in a few minutes, to capture tables that we create, views that we create, and objects and queries. The data you load into your table and other objects is also stored, as we all know that. Um, and so, you know, storage is seriously a big concern. Information about the structure of the tables, the metadata is also stored. Um, so we have to organize all of this stuff. I might take a look. We are actually still using files, believe it or not. Um, it's still a file system. It's not like a uh, Microsoft Access file system where we have a database. When, when we create an Access database file, it's a file, an MBD file. We're limited though at 64,400 and whatever bytes for the file size. Oracle, we don't actually have that limitation, but we're still storing things physically in terms of data files. So we create data files and we assign them to different components. We use groups of data files to represent the abstraction of the disk or of the particular data that we're storing. And this is a really good picture of how the data file is made up on the operating system blocks. And it's not an operating system's core, so I'm not going to go over through the old disk storage. And you don't really need to know that for this class. What I'm trying to do is give you an overview about how data works because it's actually kind of an important issue, especially if you get into configuring or database administration. Uh, you're going to want to know a little bit of something about this. In terms of the physical structure, we still have the files and still taking up operating system blocks, and they're still formatted for the underlying operating system. So if we were at any one moment of time looking out at our database, we could actually see the physical file storage, which means sometimes if the database disk is a database, the server hard drives, when they start acting up and they get destroyed or whatever, we might actually lose data depending upon what's being stored on that particular hard drive. So we still have issues with uh, physical limitations in terms of hard drive support. Um, so we're not, we're not quite, with, this, with the basic structure, we're not quite solving that problem. Instead, what we could do is come up with redundancies, and backups and things that would solve that particular um, issue. What the scheme actually solves is the limitation. So if we have a three gig drive, it doesn't matter. We have six three to get, to get the six three gig drives to make eighteen gigs. That's how big our table space can be. That's how big our storage area is. We take the whole thing and we divide it down into files that fit on each one of the disks, but the whole thing itself is running seamlessly together. Because the format of the data is different. It's not formatted as it would be in an underlying operating system. Instead, Oracle formatted it, or it's basically being formatted 
there. And here's kind of an introduction to the storage structure. We have a thing called table space. It all starts out with a table space. The table space is the big package we're calling the disk, actually. Table space contains uh, the tables, customer segments, and extents. And we can partition that out for user accounts. We can partition it out in terms of utility for different databases, for different things that we want to do. So here's an example of a table space. Largest logical structure in the block data is the smallest inside. And the block data itself is, is basically the physical blocks on the disk. It's kind of like how we come up with in terms of Windows or in, in terms of the Mac. We have a file system. And then, you know, we have a journaling file system. We have FAT32 or FAT12 or F60, all these different types. This is the Oracle file system that uses the abstraction of the data block just the same way as those other file systems are doing it. Uh, but it's an internal proprietary structure for Oracle. And it's actually one of the things that makes Oracle unique in terms of it as a database application. So here's a little bit more detail in terms of the blocks. In the blocks, we have data files. We actually create the files. We add them to extents. They become segments that are part of the table space. So we have a hierarchy. It's not like a Windows, like different subdirectory, subdirectory, subdirectory. Instead, we have the ability to expand, make something bigger by adding more data files to it, take something away, remove the data files. Um, and so we could actually kind of logically um, configure our own storage. Nobody in the right mind is going to do this, and so what they're going to do is they're going to take the size of their disk, and they're going to go, oh, I have three gigs, and our table space is four gigs. You know, <laughs> actually not four gigs. It has to be two gigs, less than the size available. Because we need a gig left over, let's say. So they'll make table spaces smaller than the size of the disk. If you have a server system that's running with redundant, with arrays of disks, so you've got like 18 gigabytes, going back to that example, you can make a 17 gigabyte table space. You can make smaller table spaces and keep everything separate if you wanted to. If you did that, you might actually distribute the table spaces over a distributed system so that they're centrally located at different areas in the network for easily accessibility. Because here's the deal. You're still working with I.O. You still have storage. It's still being stored. Where it's being stored depends on where it's going to be loaded up into memory. If you separate things out, distribute it over the United States, let's say you have a server in Colorado and a server in California. The users in Colorado are hopefully accessing the server that's in Colorado. <laughs> if they're doing that, they're getting faster reads and writes. Their database itself is going to run a lot faster. If they're going all the way to California, not only do we have network speeds to consider, but we have, you know, bringing up files, loading it from a disk file up into the RAM memory, all the loading, the unloading, the table space. It basically is not very optimal in terms of a distributed type of environment. Sometimes you don't get a choice. Sometimes it's not distributed. It's all on one single server. Um, but those are things to think about in terms of the configuration. And depending upon how you have the configuration created, you can create your own abstraction. So here we have logical data blocks mapped directly to continuous operating system blocks in terms of the, those data files. So although we have this image of this database that's huge, it still breaks down to files. And if you've taken an operating systems course, you'll kind of see a little bit more detail into the abstraction of what, what I'm talking about. So here we have uh, SQL. Just like we created the tables, the indexes, the views, and we run queries, another set of SQL commands actually exists, and this is Oracle proprietary because not every database is going to have a create table space. But we can create a table space, give it a table space name, a data file with a file name, a size, and then we can do, you know, auto extend on and off. Make it, make, we can make our data file grow. We can make it shrink. We can, you know, if it's not, we can, you know, if we're not using up all of the space, we can get rid of our internal fragmentation. We can get rid of external fragmentation. We can actually do a lot more memory management in terms of that storage space than we can even at an operating system level. Because although we're working on an operating system level eventually, because we are creating files that we're storing on a disk, we're, we are kind of working like 200 feet above that, though, too, in the abstraction of being able to create our own impression of that database. And it's just physically stored like the underlying operating system. 
That's why people spend so much time trying to figure out what kind of server do we want to put this on? <laughs> because the underlying operating system plays a part in the efficiency. All right, here we have a temporary or permanent uh, table. So is it like, you know, is it just going to be around for particular testing, logging on and off, online, offline? Is it going to be available, not available, segment space? And for the purposes of this course, you do not need to know how to create a table space. You don't need to know any of these options or anything. What I'm trying to do is give you the concept. Unfortunately, the lecture is full of this SQL stuff. But it kind of does show you, though, that uh, if you're running as a DBA, you're going to be using create table space. And you can actually create files and add multiple files, add files to table spaces. Your database is growing, let's say. You can put another hard disk on there, create more files, add it in, and basically grow it and grow it and grow it. Because you do have a huge image that's spanning over the entire system. And the image that I keep talking about is your table space <laughs> image. And that's partitioned out, as we saw already, with those extents and those, those sub pieces that are part of the big picture. So this could be a huge thing spanning out over a lot of this. You may need to make it bigger, we'll just add another hard disk in there. We still need the hard drives. We still need the hard disk space because we need to physically store it somehow. When the database turns off, you know, it needs to go somewhere. <laughs> so we need the space. And the data files is, is the space that we're using for that. And so, um, here, this particular slide set goes through all the different options. And if you just came in late, make sure you sign the roster that's going around. It got quiet all of a sudden, so I think people got finished. Either that or they're interested in hearing this one, one thing or the other. All right, so the data file itself, you can add multiple files, separate them out by commas. You can actually create the files, and you should create the files before you start adding them to table spaces. Or you can actually create them at the same time if they don't exist. Temporary or permanent, you have an option used to create temporary table spaces that are dictionary managed because here's what you have. You have a centralized system that's managing the data and it's almost like a log, but it's a table actually because everything in Oracle is represented in a table. That's keeping track of all of the files, what extent they belong to, what table space they belong to, so that if you ever do have a problem and you have a problem with this table, you know, you can actually kind of go down and troubleshoot it all the way down to the physical disk because you know where it's being stored and go, oh, well, just take that disk out, put a new disk in. You take the disk out, you put a new disk in, you don't have to copy, do anything. You just pull the disk out, put a new disk in. The abstraction of the Oracle system is going to create it for you. You do have to back up those data files because everything is stored in the data files. But you'll have, what, a disk with two files on it, three files on it, and it goes with the limitation, the size of those files plays a part with the limitations of the file system. So if the file system only allows you to create files of a thousand gigabytes or something, I don't know, maybe megabytes on that one, <laughs> yeah, so then that's what you're limited to. That means instead of one or two, you create 10 or 11 or something like that files. So you, can, you have a lot more flexibility in terms of how that is actually being done. In terms of the permanent and the temporary, the permanent is the default option, stores the data, objects, and tables permanently. It means the space is going to be used for the long term, which means it's going to be managed. Information is going to be logged about it in the data dictionary. <coughs> in terms of the extent management, whether it's going to be local or dictionary, depending upon the size of your data, it's kind of like, are you going to have one main district manager, or are you going to have department managers? <laughs> I think, you know, I can imagine locally you're going to have that department manager is going to be local, easier, especially when making changes and configurations to deal with the local guy than it is to go back to a main headquarter. Uh, so the communication, the updating of this particular dictionary, the way that it's managed is going to be a, a definitely, um, plus also the control, the user level control you're going to have over it is going to make a, a difference. So local, the default state manages the the. Default table space manages the extent free space dictionary. The table space is managed by extent free space in the data dictionary. The data dictionary is also keeping track of other information, if I haven't mentioned it already, um, in terms of the table, the construction, the views, all of the different components that are part of the system. So, uh, Logging, unlogging, are you going to you know, instantly log changes, not log changes, log commands. Um, this is the, would be the rollback information. Um, are you going to just have auto commit on everything? Um, the online, offline, are you going to make it available for use, or is it a backup? Or is it 
And sometimes you might create a table space and actually use it as a temporary holding place. Like move the table over here, use it from here while we're fixing this, this table space over here that's linked with these data files because we have to back it up or, or we have to swap out the hard drives or something. Um, so it allows you kind of some flexibility with that. The segment space management, um, whether or not you want it auto or, or manual is another option you can pick from. Auto is managed uh, by the bitmap in the, in the table space itself. Manual manages the free space with the data dictionary. So whether or not you want auto control by the headquarters manager or whether you want locally managed, essentially, is in terms of the management. So in implementing uh, the Oracle manipulated file system with table spaces, we can create. So we have DB create file destination must be set. So it tells us where we're going to put it. And the uh, create table space command, we can omit the data file if we already know by default. If we've already set a default kind of location, default data file. And what we're doing is essentially just having some options here. If we wanted to create a data file without, because here we just started with the plain table space that we created and we added data files to it, we can create a data file. So the data file clause itself has the size, has the, you know, the, the extent on and off, maximum size, it may be unlimited, which means the file can grow. Because the file might actually have some limitations. If it's trying to fit on a disk in an area that we've got it set to go to, um, the disk has got limitations. Obviously, it's got maximum megabyte count or gigabyte count. So we can actually kind of configure that so we know when we're running out of space. It actually, you know, plays well with the space management because then we can kind of figure out, well, are we underutilizing the system? Are we overutilizing it? Do we have enough to space? And we can kind of figure out the growth of the system. Because databases are one of those things that grows uh, every year gets bigger and bigger, hopefully. Otherwise, you're not really using the concept of the database. You're not, you're not keeping archiving anything. Um, in fact, if you're getting rid of information every year, you probably shouldn't even have a database. <laughs> you don't need it. You're not really using the purpose of the database. Um, well, one of the purposes of it. Um, in terms of the data file clause, this is just going through all of the different options. You don't really need to worry about this. I'm going to kind of skip through it. The extent management, this effect is again going through all of the different options that we have in terms of this create table space. And um, I'm going to kind of skip through that as well um, because I pretty much have covered actually what I wanted to introduce to you, which was the concept of the table space. And um, probably what's important to note here is the uh, concept of the hierarchy. And the hierarchy comes out to actually looking like that, actually. That, that's a good picture of the hierarchy. Um, we have the table space, and in time, inside we have the schema object. So if you're uh, familiar with Oracle in terms of the, like the web interface sometimes, people see the word object written all over the place. And uh, you can actually create a database object. And then inside of the object, create users, create tables, and create spaces. And then you can create another database object. So the objects are generally organized uh, between departments. Like HR has its own object. Engineering might have an object. And the way this is kind of broken out in terms of the scheme is where we have our objects that are stored inside of the table spaces. So we could theoretically drop one of these objects, drop the table space, clear up the table space, clean it out move this object to another table space, and, you know, basically have the flexibility of organizing the environment. And inside we have the segment concept. It's just a way of creating the storable media in terms of our extents, and our extents are going to have data blocks in it, so. Which is really all there is to the concept of data storage in Oracle. The rest of the slides, it gives you a bunch of SQL code, as I mentioned before, you're not going to be responsible for that. Um, I don't believe there's anything, you know, temporary table spaces. You know, Oracle recommends creating locally managed temporary uh, table spaces. Use temporary segments for testing purposes and stuff. Uh, because you're not allocating space in the data dictionary and you're actually using less resources. You create a temporary table space when you want to mirror another, let's say, another table for some reason. Or you want to test, you have a a sample database that you're trying to test out, or you're 
testing out some changes or something, you don't want to mess with the original one. Um, so using a temporary, when a temporary is needed, if you know you're going to use it and then you're going to remove it, if you go the temporary route, it doesn't take up as much memory than if you actually created another table space. Because the more table spaces you create, the slower the entire system will run, especially if you're using a centralized data dictionary. Because the data dictionary gets bigger. You can imagine the concept is kind of like a table. And it, well, it is a table. And so everything you're putting in the table, the bigger you make the table, it's storing the dictionary, the uh, lo longer it takes to search through <laughs> to sort it. And how often are you doing this? Every time you access data. Every SQL query, everything has to locate where this information is stored. And it's using this data dictionary. So the bigger the data dictionary, the slower your database is going to run. Which is why people make large table spaces. <laughs> and then they, uh, they load everything in one table space. And then you have other people that make tons of table spaces. And they're all small ones, or the big ones are varying different sizes. And then they go, well, how come my system's running so slowly? Yeah, those are also people that indexed everything as well. And they're updating the tables while they're indexing it. Because the indexing concept actually uses the data dictionary as well. Because it's got to, eventually you've got to go find it. And you can compare this to sort of reading and writing files. Because we're storing in data files. It's the access speed from an operating system, system's perspective of finding a file, opening it up, reading it. You're doing that when you're using the database. So that's why it's important to kind of keep in mind how big are you making these files? <laughs> and how many of them are you going to have? And how many table spaces are you going to put them in? Because what ends up happening is you could create a configuration that makes your system run too slow. So here's an example uh, of non-standard block sizes. Changing the block sizes that you're storing data in. You don't have, you're not stuck with, uh, you can actually create your own block sizes. Um, and here's a non-standard kind of list. Um, configuring and viewing storage. You can change uh, changes that you make to table space could be logged. So you can turn logging on. So, so you can actually kind of track, you know, oh who, you know, who did that? Who did this? Uh, temporary permanent settings on and off. Coalescing, which is a, actually there's a coalesce command that hardly anyone ever uses for some strange reason. And it gets rid of internal fragmentation. It makes continuous storage space. It's just like doing a defrag on your hard drive. Um, which, again, going back to the concept, why do we do a defrag? It makes the hard drive. It makes the seeks run faster, because we don't have to go to empty spaces. We don't have, it gets rid of the fragmentation. Well, the coalesce here, this is actually the uh, equivalent to that. We manually run it. And this is part of what you would do if you were a, a DBA and you were doing the maintenance, managing the storage, managing the capacity, the connection speed, you know, the data files. And you, essentially what you're doing is constantly looking to make sure you have enough room. And it's kind of like, you know, the concept of a hard drive that's really full. It takes longer. <laughs> the bigger the file, the bigger the, it takes longer to go search and find something. If you have spaces in there, it's wasting search time as well. So adding new files, renaming them, changing the size of the data files, also part of it. And here's just more more uh, SQL queries. And here you have the coalesce command at the bottom. Here, I'm glad this is in here, actually. And it says, you know, alter the table, add this data file to it. Oh, yeah, by the way, get rid of the fragmentation as well. So makes, it, makes it more efficient. You take a table space offline, you can do that. In fact, there's an SQL command that does that. Why would you want to do that? Well, if your server is under attack <laughs> and... Uh, you know, you want to take it down easily, you just take the table space offline. If you take it offline, it's protected, it's not loaded anymore. Which means, you know, unless this virus or this, this thing is going to actually get at the physical files on the, on the system and hopefully you have a backup, then you're pretty safe, essentially. Uh, methods for taking it offline, you can have normal as a default, is online temporarily, immediately. Shut it down now, shut it down in the future. The problem with, uh, you know, temporary if you have like a damaged file, then you can kind of swap the disk out, temporarily take it offline, and load it back up. Uh, in terms of the immediate, you're going to have for damaged media, for damaged disks themselves. Um, or if you take it offline, it's not going to affect the rest of the database. Because unlike an operating system, when you have... Actually, this happens. You know, people, in the old days, people's systems would crash. Actually, Linux does this all the time. And 
you got a bunch of lost clusters, you got a bunch of issues, and the system runs slower. And then what ends up happening is, you know, something that's not affected ends up being affected by it. Or in the case of a, you know, part of the disk, you get a bad block, you have these random little problems that happen when it starts to read that. You could actually just take it down, get rid of it. Uh, and then the entire system comes back up and running just normally, like it would normally do. And then you deal with the problem. When the problem's fixed, you put that back up online. So the ability to take stuff on and offline is actually kind of important, especially if you're running an application like a banking teller application. You say, okay, you can't make deposits, but you can do withdrawals or vice versa. Or, so that half your system stays up and is available while the problem part of the system can be repaired. Um, so you know, what ends up happening though is people usually take the whole thing down. You know, why in the world did you take the entire database down? It's because you have no idea, you have no organization. You have all of it's in the same table space. <laughs> and it's not partitioned out so you can selectively take something down. Because usually some of the backup software works best if you take it down, back it up while it's not running. So if you can select things and take them down at certain times and then bring them back up, you can actually do really nice backups. And, uh, actually, a lot of the utilities will do it for you automatically, actually. Um, and here's the example, alter table space accounting read only to make it read only. So you can only be queried, no inserts or updates will work. And if you're uh, doing this, what ends up happening is you get a you know meaningful SQL error that comes back and says, table space is limited to read only or table space read only or something, um, which makes it you know protective essentially. So especially if you're trying to run reports <laughs> and you want consistent data. You're running the year-end inventory in a retail store. You want to make sure people aren't making sales while you're running the report because then the number's going to change on you or something. Um, dropping table space is just like we drop tables. We can drop the table space. We can recreate it. If we drop it, we can drop it and then include extents and data files, and get rid of the data files, the extents, and everything else with it all in one shot. That's dangerous, actually. If you really want to hose somebody's system, go in and drop the table spaces. <laughs> You get the table space and everything. It's like doing a format on a drive. You get everything. But normally you're not going to have access to that. The privilege is going to be taken away, hopefully. Uh, so querying the data dictionary for storage data, as I mentioned before, we have this data dictionary. If it's managed by the system, it's going to have everything in it. And so what ends up happening is we end up having to look for to see details of the data files or details of the extents and the table spaces or you know, the coalesce free space information. So we have information in terms of the views. We look at the view. It's not the underlying table. It's actually a view, because we all know what views are, hopefully, now. And uh, the query is done on per user, per table space, per parameter, and um, a little bit easy, easier to query. So a lot of the database tools that you see on the market, the third-party tools, well, automatically, instead of having to write an SQL query to create a table space or to drop one, or to query the data dictionary to find a piece of information you're interested in knowing, like the available free space or something. Instead, what these third-party tools do is they put a bunch of images on the screen, <laughs> and they're like a meter, kind of like a dashboard. That's going to tell you, here's your database picture. This is how much free space you have. And here's your data dictionary. This is how much internal fragmentation you have going on. And it's been 10 days since you've done a backup, and you need to do a backup now. And it's kind of um, what it's doing is just automating this underlying logic in terms of managing the storage space. It's like, hey, you're going to run out of storage soon or something. Uh, but, you know, it's easier to do things with SQL. In fact, if you're familiar with SQL and you like it, you manage it with SQL as well. So the DBA does a lot of the stuff. You can find adjacent free extents that should be coalesced, as this example, by querying the data dictionary for the storage areas. So the, you, the queries that you run on this table is the same query that you'd run on any table. SQL is SQL, uh, regardless of what table you're using or what view you're using. And uh, here's a query for uh, on the storage area to find out, and as I mentioned before, allocated versus deallocated. It's going to tell us where our free blocks are. We're going to take all the free blocks and put them at the end of the disk. Same thing as a defrag in the Windows system. Identify the adjacent uh, sets of blocks, and we can just move them around manage it. We can, we can actually create our own defrag, essentially, uh, which could come in handy. Now we have this undo data. 
we have actually segments of the database uh, storage that works with data of changes that we've created. So we're in our SQL plus window and we don't want to commit, so we want to roll back. We have undo data. We also have undo data that's associated with all of the sets of DDL commands that we can do to create tables, create table spaces, create data files. So undo data is made for made of undo blocks, contains before the images of the data itself, assists in read consistency as well. Two methods for managing manual or automatic. So we can set uh, parameters in terms of how far back should we remember and um, what should we allow in terms of the undo. For those of you who just came in, we're like going to end in like 20 minutes. <laughs> but it's okay. I know I have my watch. I've been watching it. All right, so implementing the automatic undo management is one of the features. You can set the initialization parameters. In fact, most of these parameters <coughs> that you set are, are part of the creation of the table space or creation of the segment or some of the other features that we're working with. So, so in summary of our data storage overview, and this is a really quick overview, but it's really all you need to know because what ends up happening is every new version of Oracle, new interfaces to it, new features, you know, now they have like little meters and stuff and graphics and things that go along with it in terms of their tools. And the tools are just working with these underlying concepts. So in summary, database structures are divided into logical physical groups. Those are the table spaces. Physical structures include the data files, the control files, and the redo logs for each one of them. And the logs are kept separate for the table spaces. So if we have a corruption of one, as long as we're not working with just one, nothing else should be affected, theoretically, and which gives us fault tolerance for the, for the most part. Logical structures include table spaces, extents, and data blocks. The table spaces always have at least one data file because that's what's storing it. Um, where the data is actually being stored. So all the data is stored in files, and the files are just added to the table spaces. Logically managed table spaces use bitmaps to track extent free space as well. So, and um, this part we don't have to worry about. The, the little note about the dictionary managed table spaces um, kind of tells you a little bit about the efficiency, whether or not you want to have it the main dictionary manage it, or whether or not you want to have the local table spaces being managed by their own control. Uh, which could affect efficiency, but that's about it. So, The rest of these points you don't really need to know. In fact, if you have an interest, I'd go back through and read Lecture 7B, actually. And some of it is, uh, some, well, some of the options are missing out of the newer version. I would say this lecture was created around Oracle 7, and now we're up to around 11G. The concepts are the same. But I would say that there are probably some newer features and a newer control, I would say. If I were to add something to it, I would add better control. And more, maybe some more commands to uh, effectively um, process uh, some of the stuff. I know I have uh, about approximately 15 minutes, and I can get through 37 slides of reporting. <laughs> so, and uh, the reason why I'm going through this fast is because it's really not that important in terms of uh, the content for this course, but I figured uh, we should cover it. So lecture 10 is about reporting techniques. And uh, one of your assignments, actually, if you choose to do it, is to find an open source reporting program, like Crystal Reports or one of the open source utilities out there, and create a reporting engine um, in terms of the application development. I will tell you, most of the stuff today, unless it's for accounting purposes, is done through the in, done through the internet. Uh, so your reporting is going to be HTML based. Why? Because it's easier to share information. So we have a tons of tools that are available for web interfaces, servlets, JSP, all sorts of different utilities to connect to the database, run the queries on the database, report the results that are coming back, which is what reporting is all about. Um, Crystal Reports, which is still on the market, actually, it's been around for since the 80s, I believe. No, not since the 80s. Uh, maybe since the 90s. It's probably the best reporting tool. It integrates quite well with Visual Studio.net. Integrates with Visual Basic, C++. It's a, it's a nice little Microsoft toolkit. Uh, in fact, they have free module interfaces for it with Visual Studio. 
What it allows you to do is kind of connect to any sort of database, Oracle, MySQL, anything, and create reports. And you can take one report and run it from all the different databases. And you redefine the report just the same way as you would define a GUI. So, I mean, you just drag stuff on a canvas and say, I want the customer's name here, I want the customer's number here. And you could use it for invoicing, for accounting, for uh, status updates, all sorts of different things. And Crystal Reports actually has a web interface now, too. So you can make them dynamic. Why do you want that? Well, because then, you know, you print out a report, which is why everything's on the web right now. And it becomes outdated five minutes after you, before it even makes it off the printer, it's already outdated because it's working with static data that you've, you've accumulated and you're using. If you run it on the web, you get real-time data. And if the Crystal Reports refreshes every five minutes or something like that, you can see. And so people use that interface for network status. You know, how's the network running? Um, grade status, I don't know, for, you know, different types of things within companies. Um, and Oracle doesn't tell you that it doesn't sell you anything. <laughs> when you buy Oracle, you just buy the database. Like 90% of the tools are third party. Nothing is really by, unless you get into Oracle Developer, Oracle Reports, which is one of the optional lectures you can go through that I mentioned in the beginning of the course, in the beginning of today's class. The built-in features, no reporting, no forms, nothing. So when you build interfaces to Oracle, you're normally using a programming language. You're doing that because you not, rarely have a connection to a database that's standalone, that's just that connection, unless it's, a, it's an application, like a, an accounting program or something of that nature. If you're running a connection to the database, most likely you're just going to do an SQL query. And you can do that to do an update after you've taken the information from your form in HTML. You've passed it to a query using some scripting language. And this query is being run on the database. The results are coming back. So that's why most of you have jobs in development, because <laughs> it takes a real programming language and a real development toolkit to actually write the interface to the database. Nobody ever learns the database. You don't have to. And you just connect to it right? and run a query. Um, so it's kind of like two separate worlds in a lot of ways, which is why a lot of developers don't get very much exposure to the database. They're told what table to use and how to access it and what the login password is and stuff like that. But you're not really given very much information about the underlying scheme or what's going on with that database because it's, you don't have to know anything about the database. You can connect to it through your application development. So these are interfaces and tools you can see come from this list. Java Service, Java Ser JSP, ASP, very popular because they're server side scripting languages, not client side. You don't want to use a client side interface because you give the client all your code, which is your code, your login script. <laughs> you don't want that. You're not going to use JavaScript. You're not going to use a client side scripting language for anything. So you're stuck with server end. And so server end gives you PHP, very popular with MySQL. Because you get PHP, MySQL on the same server, nice little interface to the database. It doesn't really matter. Um, you know, actually the same access method for Oracle as, in terms of MySQL. It's the same concept, essentially. Just different database, different location, different IP address. Or JSP or ASP, as I mentioned before. And if you've never seen it before, here's a formatted report <laughs> from a database that shows up on an HTML page. So web interfaces, and so you can kind of read through this particular lecture set on your own. It's nice reading. Most of it is probably boring because you already know all this stuff. But if you're a business major and you're just switching to computer science or software engineering and you're taking this class and you don't have very much experience in this, this is very informative in terms of how you actually get the interface to work. If you've worked in the software engineering, uh, any, any Bit doing anything, this is way too easy for you. So that's why I don't really normally cover it. I just kind of overview it to give you the general concept of what's in this lecture. Displaying HTML code. And the way you learn this is you take, if you're not familiar with it, you take an HTML class <laughs> or you take a scripting class. Or you take a class in which you're learning the scripting language or whatever utility that you're using. So here's a scripting, uh, scripting side with applets. Actually, applets, I hate applets, and I'm so glad they're going away. Um, and I hesitate even teaching anyone about applets these days. 
they're so they're so labor intensive. You know, you connect to a website and you gotta wait for this applet to be downloaded. It's just so time consuming. And then anyone can just take that applet and decompose it from a .class file into a Java with a decompiler, any decompiler on the market, and then you got your source code. And it's like, why bother? <laughs> Put it all on the server. All the functionality happens on the server. All the code is stuck on the server. The user never sees it. All they see is the out output that's going on. So applets were nice because it was a way of creating a program, a Java program that ran and it ran through your web browser, and people were using applets to connect the databases. And uh, that's what this lecture is actually kind of referring to. But you got security problems. You got, and anytime you give the code to somebody, you, get, you have problems right there. Web server technology, this is the best way of going, where we have a web browser with an HTTP connection to the network. And then the network's going to the back end web server, and then it's on an application server with a database server behind that. Because if you keep it all on the server side, you have security, you have control, and you have processing power. Because what happens nowadays, we have mobile phones, your Android phone, your iPhone, it's all connecting to the same web server. Nice. It doesn't have to have the same processing power, although some of these phones have more power than computers these days. In fact, especially the new Android dual processors. A um, lot more power than a lot of older computers. Uh, but you can't always guarantee you're going to have that. It might be a light, lighter weight interface, not quite as heavy, what they call those thin clients, so instead of fat clients. Uh, so if you put it all on the server side, you can end up with a tiered architecture. In the tiered architecture, you can add security to that. If you take a security course, that's where you start learning about you know, how to design this web server with the application server to get the best of both worlds in terms of security. And uh, this rest of the lecture kind of goes through, you know, the whole stateless, connectionless versus connection-oriented uh, terminologies and web connections and JDBC and stuff like that. Um, servlets as a concept. Take the client server in the internet course if you're interested in building servlets because um, you can't really get that from a database course. <laughs> but it's not a bad idea to be familiar with the technology. This is a very low-level introduction and an overview of these particular technologies that you can certainly read on your own. And um, it, that's why I was saying this lecture set reads like a book. Uh, so it's not a bad, bad resource. The concept of the trigger is actually a database feature. And we didn't really talk too much about it. I've mentioned it throughout the course from time to time. It triggers a statement that's executed automatically by the system as a side effect of some modification to the database. So every time you add something in, the trigger fires and something else happens. And so a lot of people design triggers to actually do things for transaction management and for other utilities. Um, and they build them as part of the application because they happen on the database end. So you can roll something back, you can commit something. You can actually manage the transactions a little easier using triggers. So a lot of features of the database are actually kind of implemented for twofold reasons. You know, to manage the database, but also to figure out, you know, how, what about my connection to it? And what about how am I going to use it? And there's a little trigger example here that goes through, uh, you know, suppose that instead of allowing a negative account balance, the bank deals with overdrafts by setting an account balance to zero and then using an overdraft protection. So you could set up a trigger, let's say for a banking application that you're doing that would, you know, automatically use an overdraft protection account if your account was too low or something like that. So the trigger would fire if the account balance got to a certain point. If you bank with uh, Chase, they actually have user-defined triggers. And I think, they're, they're, I think they're actually triggers. You can actually set messages on every deposit or withdrawal from your account to send you a text message. And it must be trigger-oriented is what I'm thinking, because it has to do with each one of the transactions. So if your account gets updated, you know, that table gets updated, the trigger goes off, and you get a text message that says, hey, you just deposited $5. Hey, you just took out $10. Not bad, but if you have a lot of account activity, that's a lot of text messaging. <laughs> so you better have unlimited text messaging. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, so trigger events and actions and SQL. Um, you can actually take advantage of some defaults in the table by creating triggers, especially if you don't have constraints established. 
time, you don't have checks on things, you haven't made sure that everything is a number and not a character or something, you can create a trigger to make up for faults in the query capabilities or in the table constraints as well. And this lecture also kind of covers the authorization and the need for authorization in terms of read, write, update. Because when we start building, and the concept of views in terms of security, because when you start building interfaces to the database, then you start thinking, well, do we really want admin privileges to the web interface? Kind of dangerous. Uh, so in the best of all worlds, we wouldn't need any of these features. But life isn't, you know, um, not everybody out there is fair. Not everybody out there is safe. So. If we create views, we don't get the whole table, which means if a student has a view on their particular student accounts or a customer here has a view on their, their particular line, their particular branch, you're not getting all of the student information or all of the customer information, which could be a long time to query. So you're just getting subsets. So it makes everything run faster and efficient. A lot of the problems we have with applications that use databases is someone forgot to something. They haven't designed it correctly. So it's really an art of the design and not really a feature of the database um, that I'm talking about. So here's the view example. Authorizations on views. Uh, security to grant or revoke privileges um, in terms of features. And then, you know, here's some basic privileges in terms of the ability to update, you know, the ability to insert. Obviously, you're probably going to have an update and an insert ability and a read. But you're probably not going to have any of the DDL the def definition. You're not going to be able to pass a drop table space <laughs> command the uh, an SQL query from a web browser. That would, if, if you have that, I'd question the, the competency of your DBA. Mm, some limitations. The SQL does not support authorization at the row level, which is why people use views. Because you create a subset of it at the row level with the view. And then you can actually kind of customize which uh, information you're actually sending back and forth. So you cannot restrict students to see only the rows storing their own grades in terms of the rows. So Audit trails, setting up logs using, uh, as I mentioned before, we can audit the table space usage and the errors. In fact, that's a great way of seeing if your hard drive does have problems, looking at the audit trail. We can also put an audit trail with connections, and that's one of the admin features um, that you can set, and you can have a trigger that says, you know, hey, if the admin logs in, <laughs> send me a text message or something, and uh, then you know, well, the admin's in Hawaii on vacation. Why is he logging in? You know, and they go, oh, that's probably not him logging in. And then you can automatically take the entire database offline with one command, <laughs> take the table space offline. All of a sudden, nope, no access, no more. Uh, for secure, that would be that would be a drastic step. Uh, these are digital certificates with digital authentication. You'll see this a lot with databases because what do we have with databases? We have credit card transactions and we have financial transactions that occur. So the ability to merge in certificates and certificate information. Um, and I didn't. I purposely actually kind of edited this the last time. Last time I taught this class to take out some of this stuff because. With t security and this type of technology, it's changed a lot. And so now we have more of a secured transfer where we don't actually run credit card transactions through databases anymore. <laughs> so in fact, if you're going to do that, you're going to run through a well-known credit card transaction processing service that's going to do it for you because it's trustworthy. And your application not necessarily trustworthy, um, especially to the common user who's looking for the secure transaction processing, like they're going to use PayPal or something, or they're going to use something that's going to be more secure than your database probably. So That was a quick overview of Lecture 10A, because I knew it would bore you completely if I spent an hour and a half on that. Most of you who are sitting here going, yeah, thank God. Some of you are saying, I don't know any of that stuff. It's 10A, download it, reads like a book. Same thing true for the other one if you have an interest in the table spaces. The basic SQL commands are pretty much the same. Some of the concepts change with different versions, things of that nature. So, As promised, it is exactly 6 p.m., and so we are leaving today. Any comments, questions, concerns? If you filled out the survey, give it back to the TA. Don't give it to me.
If you haven't signed the roster for attendance, at least get credit for being here today. Next week, we will cover, I have another short lecture on transaction management and some database stuff, which is lecture 11. And we will be covering the final exam review next week. The final exam is not next week. I've actually had students sending me messages asking if next week is the final exam. Nope. Check the final exam schedule and then, well, these people don't show up to class. That's what the problem is. <laughs> so, all right, I'm done. You're done. Let's go home.